uh, we often, my wife and I, we, we um, debate quite often. You might call it fighting, but um, I call it debating because I'm always trying to win. I don't know if anybody else is like that in the room, um, but um, we'll have, we have this, uh, there's certain words, like, like we're going to talk about a word, a Bible word, uh, a kind of a church word here in a moment that creates this tension, um, but in our marriage, it's the word date. Anybody else know what I mean? Date. Like, let's go on a date. Have, have you noticed that? I feel alone up here right now, but uh, have you noticed that, um, man, that word is packed full of expectation? Like, like we all got a sense of what makes the perfect date night. Maybe, maybe you're not married and you are dating and you have a high expectation of what that date night is going to be. For me, a really good date has some really good food involved. I don't know if there's anybody else like that. Uh, and for my wife, she has this like ethereal, emotional ideal about connection. And I have no idea what that means, right? And, and so we come into these nights, these evenings, these breakfasts, whatever the situation might be. And we, we miss each other massively sometimes in these kind of differing expectations and differing desires that, that come out in, in these moments. I think the same is true with us as a, as a church, as a family. We all come in here with different expectations about what it means to be Jesus Church, about maybe our desires and the outcomes that we hope to see happen here in these moments when we're together, when we're in our groups together. Um, we have different mindsets and ideas and expectations. And every time we come into relationship with somebody, um, we're forced to reconcile those differences or else not be in relationship with those people. And if you look at culture, like how culture kind of um, helps us navigate this, it, culture has kind of created camps and, and, and parties and, and, and people that you agree with and people that you disagree with and people that you like their stuff online and people that you kind of unfollow and avoid online. And there's this polarizing of, of ideals and expectations that we're all navigating constantly. You could see like if we tried to do marriage the way culture invites us to do relationship, we would find ourselves very lonely when it comes to our marriage. Because if we have to, you know, kind of think exactly the same and expect there to never be conflict, relationship is not going to happen. There's got to be a, like a commitment underneath the surface that allows us to navigate these differences and come to a place of unity. Not in unison, not like exactly the same, but understanding and appreciation for the other perspectives and, and, and really a wholehearted commitment to walk through this together. The same is true in the, in the church that Jesus has invited us to be. We walk in here with so many different expectations, experiences. Here's the word, disciple. It's a church word. If you're not a church person, you still get the, the concept. It's like, like journeyman, apprentice, like coach, player, like leader, follower, right? There's this sense of mentor and mentee. There's, there's this idea that kind of is packed into this word disciple and discipleship. But the moment I, I couch that in church terms, we all have different ideas about what that means, different expectations. Some of you had like your favorite Sunday school teacher in your mind when I say discipleship. Others of you have no idea what I mean when I say Sunday school, so you're like, okay. Um, others of you, you, you have, a, you have a, maybe a program you went through. Maybe it's a 12-step program, or maybe it was a, a Bible study you did, or a video series you watched, or there was a curriculum that you loved, or a small group experience that you loved, or one that you absolutely hated. Every one of us has a different mindset and expectation when we throw out this word disciple. Here's the challenge is this is the word that Jesus invited us to define ourselves by if we choose to be followers of him, disciple, a disciple of Jesus who learns to make disciples of Jesus is really what we are about as a church. He, he's invited us into this mission to reach this entire world for him one person at a time. How does that happen? The way he did it was by making disciples in relationship and then sent them to go make disciples all over the world. And as they did, churches were planted. And so that's the same strategy we're trying to employ. And yet, man, if we're not together on this definition, not together on this expectation, you can imagine the mess that we're going to navigate and run into together. And so I want to bring us together today on this conversation of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for us collectively as a church together, moving, trying to move together towards a destination, this mission that God's called us to? Here's my fear as we head into this conversation. Um, 
I'm going to have you open your Bible to Matthew chapter 4, but I just want to share my concern with you for a second. I'm afraid that this is going to feel massively irrelevant to your life, and here's why. Because I, I talk to you, and I pray with you, and I, I was just hugging my friend whose wife just gave him divorce papers this week, just last service. And I was hugging another part of our church, another young woman whose um, mom just diagnosed with stage four cancer. I was praying with some of you earlier this morning. And my concern is that the, the overwhelmness of everything that you're dealing with makes this conversation feel very small and insignificant. But here's my, my hope, my promise that as your pastor, I want to walk you through this conversation and believing that this really is best for us. No matter what circumstance that you are in and you're, you're navigating and you're confused about and you're in pain surrounding, like I really believe if you and I can come together in this conversation that Jesus is going to do something supernatural in your life through us collectively as a church. I really believe that with all my heart. Otherwise, I would honestly throw this out completely right now. If I didn't think this was actually going to help us walk through everything that we're walking through right now. And so if, if you would, just allow me to lead us through this time and this conversation. I really believe Jesus can do something powerfully in your life. But let's pray as we just invite God to, to speak to us and to make this real for us as a, as a family, as a church. Lord, you know every heart in this room so much more intimately, intricately than I do, God. I'm depending on you, Holy Spirit. I depend on you to, to take your word and bring it to life in every one of our hearts. To take your, your, your heart, God, and bring it, God, to surface so that every one of us can navigate kind of where we stand in relation to you, Lord. Every word, God, that gets spoken here in the next few minutes, God, I just ask that you would cover with your grace and that you would... Just seal, God, with your leading and your purposes, God, and your understanding. God, give us all a heart to hear, a, a desire to learn, a, a, a hope, God, to grow through this, Lord. Help none of us, God, to be stuck, to be um, just sitting back, arms crossed. God, I pray that you would just break through whatever brokenness and pain, whatever issues we're navigating. God, we ask you to come and be real, God, in this time. We love you, Jesus. We trust you in your name. Can you say amen this morning? Matthew chapter 4 is where I want to kick off from today. This is the original invitation of Jesus to his first disciples. Here's what I believe. If we would look at this invitation, we could see the definition that we can rally our hearts around. Are you with me? So what Jesus intended a disciple to be, he actually reveals in this invitation. He's saying, I, I got a plan. I got, I got something I have in mind for your life. I want you to come along with me. Come with me. There's something amazing that I want to do in your life. There's something supernatural that I have in store for you. I don't want to waste your life. I actually want to heal your life. I want to actually make your life a life that you've dreamt of, that you've hoped for, that you've longed for. I'm excited to reveal that to you. Would you come with me on this adventure? Like in that original invitation to his first disciples, I really believe we could capture the definition to be rallied around, the place to align our hearts. I don't want you to get on board with like real life's thing. I want you to get on board with Jesus thing. Does that make sense? I'm going to say that one more time. I don't want you to get on board with like real life's ideas and ideals. I want you to get on board with Jesus' ideas and ideals, right? And that's really kind of the essence of this conversation that I really think can bring our hearts together. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 is where I want to kick off. While walking by the sea, this is Jesus. He's walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 19, that's the invitation from Jesus to his original disciples. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, look at their responsiveness. They left their nets and they followed him. What would cause these guys to lay down their livelihood to go after Jesus? There must be something pretty amazing about this invitation. Not burdensome, not annoying, not kind of busying for their life. Like something 
supernatural and transformational about this invitation. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, his son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. They're fishermen as well. He called them. Look at verse 22, same response, immediately. They left the boat, they left their father, and they followed him. What is in this original invitation from Jesus that would, would be like good for us to come around today? It's a really simple invitation. Come follow me. I'm going to make you into something that you're not right now. And I'm going I'm to teach you how to fish for men. There's really three parts to this definition that we see in this invitation from Jesus. One, a disciple of Jesus is pursuing an intimate, connected relationship with Jesus. Come follow me. This is an invitation to relationship. It's not an invitation to information. Think about some of us approach Jesus as a religious teacher, leader, model that we got to kind of get to know like intellectually. Like intellectual ascent is a huge part of this, but, but relationally is something totally different. Would you agree? Like to know about somebody is one thing, but to know somebody is something totally different. That's the invitation from Jesus, from God himself. Think of this. The creator of the heavens and the earth made us to be in relationship with him. This is how you and I are designed. So anytime we're outside a relationship with God, we are defeated. We are without purpose. We are beyond what we are made to be. You feel disjointed like your life doesn't make sense. The good news is this, God sees us separated from him. Why are we separated from him? Because the standard of relationship with God is perfection. Every single one of us falls short of that standard. It's called sin. Sin leads us out of relationship with God. It's a rebellious spirit inside of us that leads us away from God's design. But God doesn't stand at a distance condemning us. In love, he sends his son Jesus to save us. That's this picture. Jesus is just now on the scene starting his mission of reconciling a lost and broken world back into relationship with God the way they were designed to be, the way we were designed to be. He does that, Brennan shared it a moment ago, by going to the cross on our behalf, defeating sin and death in the grave, resurrecting from the dead three days later, and offering restored relationship with God to anyone who had put their faith in him. How does God choose to do this? By saying, come, follow me. Come into relationship with me. I want to show you who my father is. I want to show you what it's like to be in relationship with your creator. Come on. I want, I want you to get to know what God is like, what he loves, what he hates, who he's with, who he's not with, how his values are, who he judges, who he shames, who he, who he loves, who he serves, how he does all of this. Would you come with me? It's, a, it's an invitation to relationship. And I think that it would be easy to disconnect in this conversation right here because many of us have never experienced authentic relationship. Here's the enemy's tactic. Jesus said that there's an enemy of your soul. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy you. Here's a great way to destroy any hope you might have in a relationship with God is give you zero hope in relationship, period. All you've known is brokenness in relationship. You've seen divorce. You've seen devastation. You've seen people walk away. The enemy's tactic is to destroy relationship as a whole so you have no concept of what a relationship with God would look like. Hear the invitation from Jesus. Come on. Come on, I have a way that's better. You may not know it. You may not get it. You maybe have never seen it, but I want to show it to you. Would you come with me? Here's the creator of the universe, the one that created relationship, offering to show you what relationship looks like. That's pretty good, isn't it? And I think that this touches kind of a, a chord for us because relationship is such a longing inside of us that many of us have even, in all the pain that we've experienced, we've, we've actually gotten to the point where we're convinced that we don't need relationship because it just never seems to work. This is how crafty the enemy is. Any place that you can identify in your heart that's hopeless, that's where the enemy is winning in your life right now. And if, he's, he's hope, if you're hopeless when it comes to relationship, I want you to hear this, that that's the enemy's work. He's stealing, he's killing, and he's destroying this picture of what God intended for your life. 
hear the invitation of Jesus this morning saying, hey, come follow me. I want to show you what it's like to be in relationship with the one who created you. I want to invite you into an intimate, connected relationship. I want you to experience something that maybe you've never experienced before. Would you come with me? And so you and I, as a disciple of Jesus, are learning to connect with Jesus in a meaningful way. When we're, when we're singing songs together, it's not just about doing church songs. It's about connecting to, to our God through these, these conversations, through song, right? This is an intimate thing. I don't know if you've ever tried to sing to somebody before. Yeah, it's hard. I don't like sing to my wife. Like, I can't sing, period. We kind of make fun of each other singing. But, but at the same time, there's this, like, intimacy in singing. Have you noticed that? That's why we turn the music up a little louder, right? So you can't hear yourself sing. I am serious about this, okay? Like, I don't want to hear you sing, and I don't want you to hear me sing. So, like, let's connect to God in this moment. Like, there's an opportunity for us to, to, to connect to him in a relational way. The second part of this definition is really powerful. Jesus says, come, follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Listen to this intent from Jesus himself. I'm going to make you into something different than you are right now. This is where I think the attraction for the disciples came. You mean I can have a life that's different than this one that's controlled by, by the chaos of my circumstance? Like, yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave these nets and this livelihood behind because, because I'm tired of this life that never seems to work anyway. There's an invitation from Jesus to transformation. This is not an invitation to a, a greater burden and more busyness in your life. This is an invitation from God himself to change you, to heal you, to transform you, to make you somebody new. Not better, new. There's a place where my heart is just burdened for us as a people. It's right here. I'm afraid that we've missed the heart of God at times when we've, we've heard this invitation from Jesus and we've misconstrued it to mean like, oh God, I, I, I'm gonna have to get busier. I'm gonna have to try harder. I'm gonna have to do more, God, for you to like me a little bit more, for my life to be a little bit more cleaned up. And we interpret God's invitation to transformation as a burden of something that we gotta carry when the opposite is absolutely true. Jesus watched a generation laden by this attempt to make their life better. And he said, stop. Come to me, all of you who are weary, all of you who are heavy laden, heavy burden, and I will give you rest. I, 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 wanna, I want you to take my yoke upon you. It's this picture of, of, of a master inviting a disciple into a different kind of relationship. I, I want you to have a relationship with me where, where my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Like you can come to me and I'm going to give you a rest like you've never known before because it's going to be my power working in you to change you. It's not going to be you working harder to change yourself. Why would those disciples leave everything to go follow Jesus? Because they had this hope in their heart that Jesus' way was better than their way. I'm afraid we've lost that hope. I'm afraid that we're convinced that, Jesus, I got a way about this life, and I need you to kind of make it a little bit better, if you would. I'm afraid we're sitting here today hoping Jesus is the antidote to our kind of hard life that we're struggling with. When Jesus is like, actually, I came to give you a whole new life. I really hope that, that you and I can gain a picture of transformation. The sneakiness of the enemy, again, is this, that we hear the good news of Jesus, that God loves us enough to send his son to come die for us, take sin and shame on himself, go into the grave and defeat it once. This is what the Bible says, once and for all. Amen. And then we kind of pick up all of our burdens and all of our brokenness and all of our addictions and all of our stuck spots. We're like, well, thanks God for dying for my sins. Now I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to get rid of this garbage in my life. It's hard. I'm afraid that, that, in our attempts to get things better about our lives that we've disconnected from Jesus when the invitation from himself was, hey, I will make you. Not you will make you, but I will make you. 
See, the gospel isn't just about the love of God. It's also about the power of God. The power of God for transformation. So here's the issue. Is God's power enough to transform you? Is God's love enough to come and get you and invite you into this? I believe it is. I hope you're hearing that it is. But then the decision for each is, okay, God, is your power enough to heal me, to break this bondage in my heart, to give me freedom from this anger, to change this attitude, to help me not be so rebellious toward my spouse, to help me not be so insecure in my relationships? God, is your power enough to to change the way I think about, like, how I relate to people. Like, I, I think about myself in this whole equation. Like, I, I'd love to just go below the surface with me at 1056. Can you do that? Like, I think about the way that I have this, like, weird kind of sense of trying to get, like, recognition from people. This is just Richie. And in so doing, I, I, I'm disconnected from God and I'm trying to meet some sort of weird emotional need in my own heart. Like, hey, am I loved? Am I valued? Am I appreciated? And I'm completely independent of God's love, God's value of me, God's appreciation of me, God's love that would send him to this planet to walk in my place and die for me. I'm completely disconnected from that. I've got this weird way of thinking that says, well, Rich, you gotta, you got to earn this appreciation. you got to get this recognition. you gotta, you got to go try to manufacture it for yourself. And here's what I've noticed about myself, and I think it's probably true for a lot of us, is that we believe that the power of God is there for salvation, but we really haven't connected it to are those really super real places in our hearts and our minds. And so we've got this stuck spot that we just operate in. Maybe you're addicted to porn. Maybe you just keep giving your body away to another, another guy or another girl just trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment. Maybe you can't get off of the success ladder. You just think your recognition in the business world is going to make you right somehow and whole somehow. Like, I don't know what the stuck spot is for you. Maybe it is anxiety. We were praying about depression, suicide. Like, we have these places in our hearts where here's what I'm convinced of is the enemy is winning. He doesn't have the power to win, but we've given him the power to win. And he's winning. And so, 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 God, would you, by your grace, you say you will make me into somebody new. God, would you... Make me in somebody new right here in this place of anxiety, in this place of addiction, in this, this relationship that I can't get enough of. God, would you make me somebody new where, where, where alcohol seems to be the thing that controls my decisions in my life, God? Would, you, would your power show up in this place too, God? You see, see what I'm talking about, real life? Are you with me? I know that we kind of went below the surface here a little bit, and it's uncomfortable for some of us, but I want you to hear this like, like Jesus' invitation is into a, into a whole new life for us. I could think about what, what he's inviting these disciples into, and I, I just am struck by why they would leave everything to go follow him. And I, I just can't help but think, man, that's really why most of us are in the room today. It's because we're tired of a life that doesn't work and we're expecting that if God really is God and he really does love us, that he has a life that, that we can't figure out on our own. And so God, here I am. Show me how to walk towards that transformed life that you're inviting me into. And, and we need relationship with each other. I love that we were holding hands a few minutes together praying over some of these things because th that's a moment where we can, we can lift each other up and, and support each other and walk with each other and remind each other of the truth that God really does have the power to overcome that sin in your life. And he really does want you free from that addiction. He really does see that relationship and know that, that it can be whole and healed and that it can be transformed. Like he really does want that for you. And man, what a, what a chance we have to become a family together as we start to believe these things together and call this faith into each other's lives and expect God to do something supernatural in each of us. But man, it's kind of got to start at this place of unity. Like Jesus, you invited us into a relationship with you and you want to change us. Disciple of Jesus pursues Jesus. Disciple of Jesus changed by Jesus. The last thing he says is this, I will make you fishers of men. Why does Jesus want to change the, their mission? Because somebody that's being transformed, I want you to think about you, transformed, completely new. 
what happens when like your life is completely radically changed? You can't help but just like tell everybody you know what God is doing in your life. He's like, yeah, I'm going to show you how to fish for men. And it's going to start in this place of transformation in your own life. Because there's a whole world out there that's dying for transformation. And they need to see some pictures of what healing looks like, what transformation looks like, what normal, ordinary people look like who are, who are filled with the power of God transforming their lives and their priorities and their healing their their bondages and breaking all these chains and these things that have held them back like there is a city called Spokane that is desperate for hope that there is a real God that can really heal them and really change them and man I just need a people that are willing to yield to my transformation in their life so I can put them really my glory on display through them in this lost and broken city are you in? Come on, let me, let me show you. Come, come follow me and I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. So I don't think Jesus had to do much arm twisting in this invitation, did he? I get this wrong in my preaching, I do. I feel like sometimes I'm the Holy Spirit's like secret weapon to twist your arm. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's not my job, right? I think this invitation is so good that the Holy Spirit doesn't even need my help. I think this invitation is so good that God is, is speaking to many of your hearts right now going, hey, you've been stuck. You've been missing something. You've been, you've been trapped by the lies of the enemy, and I want to set you free. Would you come with me? I want to show you what relationship looks like. Would you, would you come with me? I want to, I want to reveal to you what, what transformation can happen in your life. There's a whole city, that you, a, a workplace, there's a neighborhood, there's, a, there's kids that you have in your home that are waiting to see what a transformed mom and dad look like. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an ex-spouse that's waiting to see what a transformed ex looks like. There's a friend that's still sitting at the bar that's waiting to see what a transformed alcoholic looks like. There's a friend that just will still be sleeping with everybody they can possibly be sleeping with. They need to see what like wholeness looks like outside of that kind of pattern of living. They need to see that it's possible to be transformed and whole beyond another human being and giving yourself away that way. There's, there is so many people around you that are longing to see that transformation is actually possible in their lives. And Jesus has us sitting here together this morning going, hey, would you come with me? Come on. Come follow me. I, I want to make you a fisherman, fisherwoman. I, I want to show you what it's like to to see my kingdom come through you. Come on. I think that invitation is for every single one of us this morning. When I hear this, I, I hope that, that God's speaking to you. I've been praying that God would be. And I feel, like I said, a burden for us as a church. There's kind of this weird feel for me personally. We just crossed nine years last week and Honestly, I could say I was one of the most discouraging weeks that I've experienced in the, in the history of real life in the last nine years. Not because anything was wrong, but I think that there was just this sense of loss in my heart. You know, we sent Shane to Cheney. I, I love that guy. I know that we're supposed to send our best. I know that's what Jesus calls us to, but I sure would like to keep him here same time Brennan's you saw my email resigning and trying to navigate all that too it's like whew, it's discouraging sometimes you know and, and I can't help but think like how easy it would be for us to kind of lean back a little bit and just wait for all of this to kind of blow over and just see kind of how the dust settles and then choose whether or not we're gonna like wholeheartedly kind of go after this thing together. Is this really my church? Is this our family? Are we really committed to Jesus together this way? 
I just have this sense, like, for me personally, and I think for all of us, that Jesus is asking me to lean into something new that I don't really understand and I don't really know, and I'm not sure really what the future is going to hold, but I know that the mission is really the same mission. And God, like, things are changing around here, and this is not a time for me to shrink back and kind of be filled with doubt and discouragement, God, but this is a time for you to reveal yourself in a new way. And God, I don't know what your new way looks like or feels like or sounds like or smells like. God, I've only been where I've been. I haven't been here before. None of us have. So God, give us the courage to lean in. Lean into this invitation. It's a simple one. But man, when things get complicated and confusing, really all we have is the basics, isn't it? Come be a disciple of Jesus learn to make disciples of Jesus. This is how Jesus modeled that the world would be changed. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of it with you. God's got you here for a reason this morning. I wanted to speak to you. I don't know what he's saying to you specifically, but he wanted to say something to you. We listen. We respond. I want to pray for us. Jesus, you see your church here this morning making a decision. Some for the very first time to begin a relationship with you. They hear this invitation, come follow me, Jesus, and they're saying, yes, I want a life that's connected to my creator. I want a life that's being transformed by the power of God. I want a life that's on mission with you, Jesus. Amen. God, I pray you give them the courage to respond accordingly, God. Be baptized. To take that next step, God, today. Those of us, God, that have found ourselves stuck in sin, trapped by the lies of the enemy. God, I pray for freedom breakthrough, God, every stronghold that the enemy has built up in our hearts and minds, God, we just come against in the name of Jesus. You have authority, Jesus, on heaven, in heaven and on earth, God. All authority has been given to you, Jesus. And we walk and step into that authority right now. Your power over sin and death, God, is the power that we lean into together this morning. God, there is a city that's longing for transformation. God, would you, would you start that transformation in us? Forgive us for our complacency. Forgive us for our fears, God. Forgive us for fighting for the old way of life or a little bit better version of life, God, instead of the whole new life, God, that you've invited us into. Jesus, you said that your yoke is easy and your burden is light, that you would give us rest. We come to you right now asking for that, Jesus. We lay down this yoke of trying harder and making ourselves better and cleaning our act up. We lay it all down right now, Jesus. We take your yoke of transformation on us. Make us new. Make us clean. Transform us, Jesus. We honor you. We worship you. We trust you. You are good. You are loving. You are kind. so powerful. It's your greatness, God. We honor you, Jesus. Church, would you just stand with me and let's just worship Jesus together this morning. We sing this song. It's just a simple song of worship. If you need to be baptized, you haven't been baptized, our team's in the back. We'd love to pray with you. We got shirts and shorts and towels, everything we need to take that step. Go take that right now back there.